of the show will be Sally Golding. Say hello, Sally. Hi. Hello, everybody. And Adele. Hi, And we'll get those on the call very soon. So uh, thank you for joining. I see a lot of people joined early, which is great. We're giving you a little bit of a tip as to uh, a prize that we've got a little bit later on. So stay tuned for that. So um, if you haven't done so already, you've still got a couple of minutes just to go and grab a printout of your healing goal. We will be referring to that uh, later in this presentation, so I uh, would really recommend you do that. I think you'll find it very, very helpful. Um, the link to that was inside your webinar page, so um, perhaps you can dash there now and get to print out as I sort of do the introductions. Right, so uh, we have Adele, Sally, and myself uh, on the call today, and this is what we've got lined up. So do a little uh, introduction. Then we're going to look at emotions. So there's three things you need to focus on to get yourself emotionally stable. And that's really, really important. We need to get you emotionally stable before we start making big decisions and make, making changes in your life. So that's a very, very important part. And that's why we start there. Then we take a, a look at the source of your divorce. Because once we kind of crack what there's the nucleus of the problem, then we can do something about it. And um, once we kind of isolate that, we can make big strides and big changes. And ultimately, what we're trying to do here is break the cycle of failed relationships. So again, to the source of that, it's very, very important. Then, and then this might feel a bit sort of strangely, the idea of actually thriving after the divorce. But I can tell you, after the hundreds of people that have come through our programs, that's really how they feel. And this may feel strange right now to even say this, but some people feel actually divorce is the best thing that ever happened to them. It's actually a part of them growing and they've become a better person ultimately because of it. But that can feel very challenging and very hard to believe, um, perhaps at this early stage. So we'll, we'll come to that a bit more later. Uh, and whilst we will give you lots of information in this presentation today, ultimately it is about taking action because um, it's action that actually leads to change and action which leads to improvements and changes, etc. And we'll give you some suggestions about positive, powerful ways that you can take action to move forward to start your healing and start moving into a different reality and a new, a new future with lots of opportunity and excitement there. And we do have some prize giving. And so please stay tuned and take furious notes. We will be asking you a question later and it'll be on the draw. First person to answer that question correctly will win the prize. And at the very end of this presentation today, we will have a Q&A session. So if you have any questions, please do type those into your question field during this presentation. Uh, the chances are, I will monitor those questions as best I can, but for the most part, we will actually be dealing with those at the end. And we found that in the past actually been a really, really important part. So if you've had a, a question, you, you, maybe it's a situation that you're wrestling with, then you know, why not ask us and you can actually get some really great live response from our experts here on the call today. So a very, very brief introduction. Um, I, I matter the least on the call here today. I'm really just going to act as your MC. Um, I am the child of divorced parents. So one of the reasons I, I really love being part of this business, part of Naked Divorce, is I know what it's like uh, to see someone that's not recovered from divorce. My parents got divorced when I was relatively young, about eight. My mum never got over that divorce and she never went on to another meaningful relationship. And ultimately she died without ever having that in her life. And that, for me as her son, was always incredibly tragic and sad. And you know, I can do something um, to help other people break through that uh, and to lead more exciting lives in the future, then that's uh, a big part of why I like being part of Naked Divorce. We have Sally on the call here. Sally is uh, one of our divorce coaches. She hosts uh, retreats in Cape Town, South Africa, a beautiful part of the world. And she deals a lot with our UK, European and African clients. Now, I must say that actually we've had lots of people want to join our company, Naked Divorce. A lot of people that go through our programs actually ask to become what we call angels to support other people going through these difficult situations. But, you know, not many are up to the grade. In fact, we have yet to actually accept anybody um, onto the course because, you know, it takes a lot of skill. And actually, uh, sadly, is some bit we actually sort out and she's got a huge amount of experience uh, in the past of helping people through very difficult times. Um, in fact, Adele, maybe you want to say a few words about why it is that 
we sort of basically found Sally and, and brought her into the, the community. Yeah, so Sally completed um, the program, you know, over a year ago, and there was just something very, very special about her. So either the fact that she has a, a, a counselling qualification, she's a, you know, a trained counsellor, she's also a very special person. She has what we call the angel qualities, the director of a foundation for underprivileged in Thailand. Her, she's herself divorced, but she's also, she was a single parent. She has four children, two foster children, and she has a really successful, amazing next relationship. So, you know, those are kind of the key kind of factors of what makes a great angel is someone that can kind of walk alongside somebody who is going through something really traumatic. And Sally really embodies all of that and, you know, runs really successful retreats. And that's just kind of a, a picture of all this stuff. And you can see she's, you know, running retreats in Cape Town as well. So actually, Sally, maybe you can just very quickly talk through some of these pictures here. So in the top left there, actually, with two of your many children. Yes, there's two of my daughters. Um, that's uh, Maggie, who's in her 30s, and Na, who's now in her 20s. In fact, Na just graduated from university. She got her certificate on Monday, so we're very proud of her. Um, and I've done most of my work in northern Thailand, which I absolutely love. Um, including working a lot with orphans and um, scholarship students. At the mo uh, we have on average about 40 scholarship students going through different various uh, courses. Um, and we do lots of projects in, in orphanages and helping uh, also children that are handicapped. And in the middle there, you'll see me in Cape Town, which is where I now live. Um, and there I'm with uh, one of our participants who very successfully um, went through the course um, and has now um, actually fully completed the course just recently um, and is very successful in her life as a public speaker. Great. And so Adele, uh, some of you may know Adele. She, she's the founder of Naked Divorce and the creator of the 21 day program, as well as the divorce uh, haven retreat. Now she actually comes from a corporate background and that may seem a little strange to some, but basically she helps big companies get over change. So when a big company such as General Motors, Philips, Xerox, IBM, etc., have maybe laid off 200 staff and there's a big emotional problem there and to get everyone still enrolled and she goes in and deals with those and gets all those people on board so it's all about change management it's about getting people through a period of change and because of her work for there and particularly with the 21 day program she's been featured across uh, many many media yeah and if i can just say a, a point on that so i am a, a trained trauma counselor as well and i think what I really noticed what was missing in the therapeutic profession was any kind of focus on getting over uh, trauma quickly. You know, there seems to be an idea that if you get over something quickly, that it's somehow less viable or less feasible or whatever. And, you know, in the corporate world, we're really driven to produce results quickly. We paid for that. And actually there's no difference between a trauma in the corporate world or a trauma in any er other area of life. Like you can actually, as long as you don't skip the steps, you can actually heal quickly. And what we found, you know, we have close, we have just over 2000 people that have completed the naked divorce. Now we have a 97% success rate because we have proven that as long as you don't skip the steps, you can go through a very intensive journey in a short period of time. So you don't need to be suffering for two years, three years, whatever the story is, you know, you can actually get through something really traumatic in a good period of time. So that's really what we pride ourselves on is speed, but thoroughness. Actually, just one point on that. I don't think we talk about this in the presentations. I'll just bring up very briefly now is um, this is actually based on a science, science of perturbation, right? Yeah. So this is not just people talking on a sofa and, and it's, it's got a lot of science behind it. Right, so moving into the introduction. So let's look at the problem. I'm going to hand over to Adele to talk about this section. Okay, great. All right, so thanks all of you for joining. Let's get cracking with the actual data and information here. 
Okay, so divorce um, is a very tough trauma to overcome for for many, many reasons. Um, I think one of the key things is, you know, with anything horrible that happens in life, we try very hard not to feel anything and not to actually have lots of emotions and things that come up for us. But, you know, that is really difficult to not have those feelings because there's a lot of conflicts. We also struggle to take responsibility um, or to feel, you know, okay, fine, this relationship hasn't worked out. Maybe I've got something to do with that. And we struggle to feel okay, I've got something to do with that without resorting to some other parallel feeling of self-loathing. Um, and this feeling of, of, you know, okay, fine, I might have something to do with this. Oh, fine, it's now all my fault is one of the tricky parts that people kind of hit where they struggle to feel responsible and not beating themselves up at the same time. And that's a really a, a tough one because with divorce is this concept of we failed at something. And, you know, this is one of the biggest misunderstandings is that because your relationship hasn't worked out that somehow you have failed. And that's a complete myth. There's also a lack in the ability, you know, for people to self-soothe, to make themselves feel better. So not only are you struggling to take responsibility, you're beating yourself up because you failed at this thing called relationships, now, how do you make yourself feel better? And Sally's going to talk a little bit about some of the things that we do to help ourselves feel better in the moment um, that are not actually helpful and beneficial to us. Sometimes we become frozen in indecision. We're not sure what the right decisions are to, to take. We delegate or abdicate decisions onto other people. We start having committees around us to, that make decisions for us because we don't know what it is that we're supposed to do. Our routines go out the window. We feel very confused about, you know, what it is that we're supposed to be doing. The washing starts piling up. Maybe you don't get out of bed for days. You, you're not, you know, uh, looking after yourself. You stop showering. You stop taking care. All those routines go out the window, which leads to more instability as we go through this tough trauma. There's also a real lack in the support required to heal. There's been research that has shown that if somebody goes through a bereavement, it's actually easier in, from a societal perspective to go through a bereavement than it is to go through a divorce. Divorce is one of the most unsupported traumas in the world. Like you, you literally feel quite isolated because people, there's a stigma associated to being divorced. You know, it's kind of like, well, you, you know, you couldn't crack it. You couldn't make your relationship work. So there's something wrong with you. And that lack of support required to heal is, makes it very, very difficult and isolating for people to move on. So if you find yourself in that place where you're feeling alone, you're feeling strange, you're feeling like there's something wrong with you, that is a very, very common kind of unintended consequence of going through a divorce. And the really, I mean, for me, the, the kind of crime of the century is, is that, you know, even therapists don't appear to be really driven or focused to help you get over this quickly. Um, this kind of this experience, you know, these, these, these myths that you hear or these, you know, common phrases like, well, you know, you've been in a relationship for six years, that's going to take 18 months to get over or, oh, 20 year marriage. I mean, that could take two or three years to get over. There are these formulas that people have kind of come up with and it's utter nonsense. You know, you know, most therapists have, the ability to come up with clear goals, clear structures, and a program for people to move on. But it's much easier to just exchange time for money and, and keep people in this place where they could be getting over something for, for years and years. And it's not helpful. The last thing anybody needs is to stretch this out or to struggle with something over a long period of time. Um, and I think that more work needs to be done to formulate exactly what it is that people need to do to move on from this so that they can move on at a, at a bigger pace. The other final can, kind of thing about divorce is that we're never really taught how to process loss. Um, no one pulls you aside in high school and says, right, if you go through a trauma, this is how you deal with it. So that makes it even more tough to overcome a trauma like divorce. Now, Rose Kennedy, um, she has this great quote where she says, it's been said that time heals all wounds. I do not agree. The wounds remain, and in time, the mind protects its sanity, covering them with scar tissue, and the pain lessens but is never gone. 
You know, so the critical thing here is that time really just passes. It doesn't heal the wound. So even that statement of, oh, just give it time, you'll feel better, it doesn't actually do anything. So it's really important what you do with your time to assist you in your healing. Healing is a very active journey. And if you're sitting around passively waiting for something to occur while time is passing, you're not putting yourself in the best position to actually move on from this trauma in the most effective way. So taking lots of time to heal can actually lead to what we call a very false sense of healing. If you elongate this a little bit too long, you can become frozen in time. It's a bit like um, the character Miss Havisham from Charles Dickens's Great Expectations. You know, I don't know if you've seen the film or read the book, but she, you know, gets stood up at the altar and, and she just, everything just freezes in time for her. She's stuck in this old house and all the plates are still around. She's still walking around in her wedding dress and it's been 30 years and she hasn't really moved on. And, you know, that's a very, very scary prospect for certain people. And, you know, you know, we all know the person that's still, you know, 17 years later, they're still wearing their wedding ring and they haven't dated and they haven't moved on. They've just like frozen in time. So if you take too much time to heal, that's actually really negative. So false healing can often lead to illness. You know, if you spend lots and lots of time feeling bitter or resentful or upset about something, it can make you quite twisted. And, you know, as Simon's kind of situation with his mum, she became riddled with cancer within a few years of just being consumed with hatred and consumed with upset over this divorce that, you know, was happening to her. And she never really moved on from that. False healing can also lead to a lot of resentment and bitterness, and, and that can impact, you know, your looks, it can impact your way of being. You can, you know, walk around and people just kind of sense this bitterness within you. It can lead to really destructive behavior post-divorce. I mean, everyone knows the story of when Britney Spears shaved her head or, you know, people just going a bit off the rails or booking their one-way tickets to Bali to go and find themselves. You know, anything that is crazy like that is it can be really destructive and lead to issues later on. The decisions you make in a divorce are critical for your future. And if you make the wrong ones, it can really lead to destructive kind of outcomes. False healing can also have a really severe impact on those closest to you. You know, without even knowing it, you could be really draining the life out of those around you, dominating conversations with your divorce story. You know, people are tiptoeing around you or people are avoiding you. If that's beginning to happen in your life, you need to take a long look at yourself in the mirror and go, oh my gosh, this is actually completely dominated my life. Maybe I need to do something about this. People are avoiding me or I feel I can't talk about this with anybody anymore. That's a good sign that it's time to move on. False healing can also lead to a lot of relationship baggage. And I think this is kind of one of the sad parts for me is that, you know, people don't get over their divorce properly and they think it's all about, well, I found the wrong person. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the right person next time and that's going to make everything better. <laughs> that hardly, you know, most times if we don't process what has happened, the chance of finding almost the exact identical same person is very, very high, you know, and you, you, could you repeat the same patterns over and over again until you actually learn those lessons and move on. You can also have a lot of baggage that impacts your relationship with your next partner and can wreck that relationship or, or, you know, kind of destroy something that's really happy with insecurities and weirdnesses. It can also really impact your children negatively. You know, so if you're noticing behavioral changes with your kids and don't just turn around and go, well, it's my ex's fault. The ex is psycho or the ex is a narcissist or, you know, a problem. You have to take a look that you have something to do with this happening. And if your kids are having negative impact, like, the you know an airplane decompressing and they say that you know the masks fall down from the ceiling you must put the oxygen mask on yourself before you help anybody else so to really help your children you need to really process this and move on so that you're in the position to do that you know and if you don't really process this divorce you need to kind of admit and face that 
you know, with this trauma, if you don't get over this, the chance of you having a future divorce is also quite high. So you've got to, the statistics are not with you. You know, most people just rush out of one marriage straight into the next one. And the failure rate for marriage just increases um, exponentially. You know, the second marriage failure rate is close to 60% and it just keeps going up third marriage, fourth marriage, etc. So to not be in this camp and step off this crazy roller coaster, you've got to stop from the first divorce. You've got to process that properly, get over it really, really powerfully and be wide awake with wide open eyes as you move into your next relationship. So emotions, let's take a look at some of the critical things that you can do to really move on from this from an emotional space. So there are 12 things that you need to focus on to get yourself emotionally stable. In this webinar, we're going to cover three of them, but be aware that this is just the beginning. This is like the tip of the iceberg. There's actually really critical things that you need to do to, to kind of feel better, all right? But here's some things that you can give a go to try that. So first things first, you really need to get grounded. So Sally's going to talk about some of the things that you can do to get grounded. Okay. Wow. Getting grounded. It's uh, probably one of the most important things because um, when we go through a trauma like this, it's um, one of the being grounded is one of the first things that goes out of the window. We lose our routines, we uh, lack sleep often, and when this happens, the one, for number one priority should be go, to go back to the basics and establish a grounded routine. It has a very particular purpose. The more aware of and faithful you are to the rituals and routines that help you feel rooted, the more adaptable you will be when life throws you a curveball. Particularly, a grounded routine helps you from internalizing that chaos so that no matter what is going on around you, you'll be able to maintain your balance and stay solidly grounded. As we move on, this very important one is a steep, what we call a steep. We need to avoid short-term emotion avoidance tactics. Okay, so I just want to kind of jump in here when we talk about short-term emotion avoidance tactics. So one of the critical things is when you are all over the place emotionally, your routine does go out the window. So you really need to kind of take a look and see what are the things that you can do that will stabilize things in your life? Like what are the, the steps, the, the kind of faithful things that you always do that gets you back into that grounded space? You know, maybe it's making breakfast every day. Maybe it's getting back to cooking. Maybe it's getting back to the gym. Maybe it's, you know, going for a long walk, taking a lunch break, whatever it is that works for you that kind of feels okay i need to get back to these routines you that's like a really important thing that helps ground us emotionally okay and when we talk about you know all these different things that you can do it's about these rituals that you put in place and they make you feel rooted they make you feel okay even when something is throwing you a curveball Okay. And they're going to prevent you from internalizing all this chaos. So no matter what is happening, you are feeling grounded. Now, a short-term emotion avoidance tactic is exactly what we want to avoid when we're trying to heal. So when you're trying to heal from something, you need to confront your emotions. You need to kind of, kind of go there so that you can get over it. And what we tend to do is like, while time is supposed to be healing this wound is we we spend lots of time looking for things that are going to make us feel better in in those moments you know okay i'm going to go crazy i'm going to go do retail therapy i'm going to I mean, what are some of the things that clients have done so it's um, like over dependence on alcohol or prescription drugs um becoming workaholics absolutely i mean you know what was you know one of our clients she she would 
eat her hair. I mean, it sounds absolutely ridiculous, but you know, we have these stress reactions that we do that makes us feel better in the moment. You know, we like, you know, rush around and order, over order things on Amazon, or we, you know, have a stress reaction, like we eat our hair or we, we pick our skin or, you know, it's, it's things that you do in the moment that makes you feel better in that moment, but it actually can be quite damaging. Absolutely. And I think probably one of the, the ones I fell um, uh, into quite a bit was um, over um, compensating by trying to love my children too much, trying to be the best possible mother there was on the planet, um, you know, doing everything I could to avoid confrontations with them, helping, trying to make their life as smooth as possible. But actually by doing that, I was replacing emotions and feelings that I'd lost by, by using my children. And that, of course, in the long term can be damaging in all sorts of ways for them and for their lives. Absolutely. That's a really good one. So, you know, if you can kind of see that you're busy bodying yourself with your children and maybe, you know, it, it, could be, it could be feeling quite a lot of pressure for them in their lives if you're doing lots of things for them. You know, you also have to take a look anything that you're doing to excess that is actually making you feel better, but has a negative consequence needs to be looked at, you know, and alcohol is a massive problem that we see. I mean, it's one of the critical parts of the program we have to address is that people are not resorting to numbing themselves with, with alcohol and with drugs to kind of feel better because in the long run, that's going to have very negative consequences. Absolutely. Um, and we wanted one of the things that would be very um, important for you to do is to actually take some time to think about what your grounding routine could be. There are many different things, um, but of course, looking at your daily schedule is one of them and establishing certain things happening at certain times. One of the most important and key ones, of course, is sleep and going, if you can uh, go to bed on time. Um, it's very important. Okay, so what I think we'll do is just take a minute or two right now, because there's no better time than right now, <laughs> to actually think about what your grounding routines could be. And while you're thinking about your grounding routines, I want you to also take a look and see what are the short-term emotion avoidance tactics that you've been using to kind of stop you from your healing that have prevented you from moving on and that are negatively impacting your life. So just take two minutes. We'll time you take a pen and paper and just think about what your grounding routines are and what your steeds have been that have been negative for you and just make some notes. okay you have just over a minute left so take another minute to just think of your grounding routine and the states that you're going to be giving up Okay. All right. So time's up. I hope that you've come up with some ideas of what your grounding routine can be 
and also taken a look at some of the short-term emotion avoidance tactics that you can let go of. Next up, let's talk about your healing goal. Having a really powerful healing goal is another thing that you can do to stabilize your emotions. Now, what on earth is a healing goal? So I hope all of you have kind of printed out your um, handout that we've been giving you. So, you know, you would have had all your different bits and bobs. We're going to walk you through what all this is in a moment. Okay. So a healing goal has a very, very specific purpose. It's not like some conceptual thing in the sky where it's like, well, at the end of this, I'm going to be feeling happy, joyful, and at peace. That's very conceptual. The real core thing with a healing goal is how do you know that you've achieved that healing goal? What is it that's actually happened that proves to you that this healing goal has happened? So you need to be really specific. A healing goal is much more than just a conceptual thing. It's a movie. It's a real life thing that you can imagine yourself in. It has a beginning. It has a, be a middle. It has an ending. It is a daydream that you can escape to that really feels real for you. And you can see that if you have achieved that, that that has really um, happened within your life. So let's talk about exactly how to design a healing goal. And you'll have some time on this call as well to go through your handout and to work on your healing goal. Okay, one of the most, uh, the first things is you need to be specific. Really uh, put down what you are imagining and what you can uh, feel happening to you. First of all, you need to actually maybe even if it helps you close your eyes and actually see what is happening to you. It could be that you want to uh, dance freely and without any um, thing inhibiting you at all. Well, think about that. How are you dancing? What are you doing? All right. Let's look at another example of the visualization. So it might be that in your visual your visual kind of or your feeling or your hearing kind of experience, you see your ex in the picture and you see yourself being able to interact with your ex in a harmonious way. Okay. Maybe that's a really amazing goal for you, particularly if you're a co-parent or maybe your ex isn't in the goal at all. As Sally says, maybe you are freely dancing, freely enjoying yourself, skipping along on the beach you know, so the location is really key. Like, where are you in this healing goal? What is your happy place? Are you in a forest? Are you in a lovely home that you know? Are you on the beach? You know, where are you? What is happening? You know, who are the people that are around you? Are you on your own feeling amazing? Or are you with, surrounded by your children or by people that you care about? How are you interacting with these people? What's actually happening in your movie? So you visualize that and you have an inspired outcome. It's something that's like, you know, this is something that makes you feel really, really great. And of course, it's always very important to commit these things to paper. So if you want to take a minute, um, you'll see that, the, that it's laid out there for you. And as you're writing it down, don't just see it and feel it but actually see can you can you have you got a taste in your mouth what are you smelling what's going on around you because all of your senses are involved in this process it's very important to involve every sense great and if you see from the handout we give you prompts across what we call that go so we're asking you from this healing goal perspective what are you seeing what are you hearing what are you as Sally said, tasting, what are your feelings? Are you, what are you feeling like viscerally in your body and how are you feeling emotionally? You know, and it might be that you can't visualize your healing goal, but you can feel it. Okay. If you can feel your healing goal, then you're more of a kinesthetic kind of person. But if you can, if you have a strong visualization sense, then you really need to visualize that really strongly so that you can feel yourself being in that positive environment. And this is something that I want you to retreat to on a regular basis, particularly when you're going through something quite traumatic, having a strong daydream and visual 
auditory, kinesthetic experience that you can kind of get lost in is such a positive thing that you can do every single day that controls your emotions and guides you into that good step. Now, within the, the Naked Divorce program, we also have what we call a breakup reboot. And this is a, a special audio program that we um, designed uh, that has lots and lots of kind of calming, peaceful um, suggestions. And you can, you know, lie back and listen to it and really visualize your healing goal in a very specific way. So for 26 minutes every day, you're kind of in this happy place. And, you know, if you're going through something really horrible, being in a happy place is, is kind of really desirable at that time as well. Okay, so in your healing goal, you want to have that clear action plan and accountability. So, again, I'm going to give you two minutes, and I want you to take, go through the handout that we've given you. You know, it would be good if you've already done that, but go through the handout that we've given you and really begin to flesh out what are you seeing, what are you hearing, and don't make it conceptual. So all you, you know, engineers and bankers that are on the call where you're like, well, I just feel happy and everything's fine. This is too vague, okay? So we are asking you to be really, really specific. Be in the location of your dreams. Be with the people that you're with, okay? So take two minutes, work on the handouts that we've given you, and really come up with a really nice healing goal. Okay, so we have just one minute remaining. So take more time and just work on your healing goal steps. Really flesh that out properly. Okay, so make sure that after this um, webinar that you take time to flesh out your healing goal a little bit more. And, and you really want to, um, a strong recommendation that we have is, is to have somebody that's going to hold you accountable and have a real action plan for how you're going to get to your healing goal. I mean, within the program, we spend a lot of time working out exactly how you're going to achieve your healing goal, working on those steps, and we hold you accountable to achieve that. But if you're working in isolation, you need to find somebody in your life that you can share your healing goal with and start to develop this plan so that you can move forward. Right, the third thing you can do to really impact your emotions in a positive way is nutrition. Okay, now this sounds really woo-woo, but trust me, this is a really important component of moving on and healing. When you're going through a trauma, um, it it's actually impacts your body and your brain more than you can even imagine. Your neurotransmitters and your hormones go really crazy during a divorce. Your um, adrenal function is really stimulated. So you in that place where you're, you're ready to fight, you're ready to flee, you're ready to freeze. You know, so when you have a lot of adrenaline that is running the show, what immediately happens your body is releasing adrenaline, it's releasing noradrenaline, your cortisol levels go up, your dopamine level, levels go sky high, your serotonin levels are depleted. So your hormones and your neurotransmitters are really impacted by anything that is, that is freaking you out, okay? So if you're going through a trauma, you've got to be really clear that it's, if you're feeling a bit strange and a bit hypertensive and, and you know, not quite yourself, 
a lot of that is because your hormones and neurotransmitters have taken over. Okay. Now there's a lot that you can do from a mindfulness perspective, from a, a you know, a, a calming yourself down perspective that is going to make you feel better. But the critical thing that is going to make you feel better is handling your nutrition. When you're going through a trauma, your cell receptors are going to get blocked. You know, so if you have all these hormones that are running around, you also are in a place where you're applying the steets, the short-term emotion avoidance tactics. You're not expressing those emotions in a positive way. Whenever you're not expressing emotions, our body releases a chemical that actually blocks our cell receptors. So cells cannot communicate properly with each other. When those blockages occur, toxins can build up and we begin to feel not so good. Maybe you get an achy feeling in your chest. You start feeling tightness in your back. You know, and that's why when you go through something traumatic, your body isn't doing very well at the same time. Maybe you're not sleeping well. A lot of that is because of these transmitters and the hormones that are taking over. And this lack of emotional expression at the same time doesn't do anyone any favors. So when these cell receptors get blocked, it leads to a toxin buildup. And in those moments, diseases can occur, aches and pains can occur. Sometimes people can go through a, a stage of premature aging. So we all know people who have gone through something really traumatic. Suddenly their hair has just gone gray. You know, suddenly they look like they've aged overnight. A lot of that is because of the traumatic experience that your body is going through. Sometimes we use food to kind of, you know, help us feel better in the moment. That's when food can become an avo avoidance tactic and that can lead to weight gain. So it's really important that when you're going through a divorce, you need to treat yourself like an athlete. So we have a, a kind of trauma diet that we use within the Naked Divorce where we really prescribe certain foods that you absolutely need to cut out and certain foods that you really need to be eating more of. So I can give you just a few tips within this webinar. So critical thing is you need to up the green foods, anything green. If you can throw in some green stuff, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you're already making strides forward. Critical number two, you need to cut out the alcohol. Alcohol, although it might makes a, a difference in the moment and numbs things and makes you feel better. It has, you know, it takes five days for alcohol to leave your system and impact your emotions really negatively. So the more alcohol you drink, the more this is going to be impacting you in a very negative way. So definitely cut out the alcohol and cut out all the other stimulants. Drugs are also not helpful. Too much coffee can make you feel more jittery. It also increases uh, your cortisol levels in your, in your body. It can also increase your dopamine levels. And dopamine is the neurotransmitter that can make us feel achy, um, in our chest where we feel like we've literally had our heart kind of cut open. That is a dopamine kind of response. So up the greens, remove the stimulants, um, get rid of the coffee, start really focusing on gentle exercise. Any exercise that is too heavy can also increase your cortisol levels and make you feel more jittery and out of control. You want peaceful exercise. So, you know, high intensity for no more than 15, 20 minutes or yoga, Pilates, meditative kind of exercise, deep breathing, walking. This stuff is really going to be good. The other thing is you need to cut out sugar. Sugar is one of the most dangerous things when you're going through um, an emotional trauma. It also uh, destabilizes the neurotransmitters and the hormones. So, Try and get your sugar under control by increasing healthy fats, okay? So replace the really sugary things in your life with full-fat Greek yogurt, avocados, you know, almonds, you know, healthy fats that you can incorporate in your, in your diet that are going to, you know, just give you a better shot at moving forward in a good way. So those are kind of three critical things that you can do to help get your emotions under control. As we did say at the beginning, there are 12 things. We've given you three. Get the grounded routine. Get rid of those short-term emotion avoidance tactics. Focus on a healing goal that is really, really specific and focused. And sort out your nutrition. Treat yourself like an athlete. Next up, the source of divorce. All right, again, there are 15. We're going to take you through five of them. 
Okay, so finding out what the source of divorce is, is really critical to taking responsibility without beating yourself up. Okay, so if you can see that you are in every relationship that hasn't worked out, you can kind of admit that to yourself without feeling a sense of self-loathing. I think that's a really positive step. You need to be able to look at, you know, what did I, what do I have to do with this happening? And if you can own that, that's a really powerful, positive action that you can take to move forward in your life. So I'm going to go through five possible sources of divorce. And just as, as I'm speaking, take some notes and see if you can identify yourself in maybe one of these. If you can identify yourself in five, then you are really making some good strides during this webinar. So we have a concept of not managing the five R's consistently. Okay, so the five R's of relationships, this concept is when you're in a relationship and you know, you're starting to argue a lot with your partner, you're, you're not getting on, you're starting to resent them, you're starting to feel repressed and you're starting to feel resigned, you're starting to feel um, resentful, okay? Resentful, repression, res resignation, resistance, all these R's in the relationship it's kind of like a, a, a chain that we, we, we end up in. So you start off, maybe you feeling a bit irritated, but you step over that. You don't say anything. So you, you're feeling this resistance and this irritation with your partner. You don't do anything about it. That gets worse. It then moves into a kind of a resignation where you're like, you know what? They always do this. They never listen to me. They never you know, helpful. And you start making these big conclusions and you start removing yourself from the relationship where you're getting more and more resigned, more and more irritated. And as you move down this chain of ours, you end up really repressed and you're removing yourself more and more from the relationship. Now, if you caught the first irritation and really address that in a calm and peaceful communication, you would have prevented that chain from happening where you end up removing yourself from the relationship entirely. That is called managing the five R's in a good way. If you didn't do that in your relationship and just steadily over time, things snowballed and you removed yourself more and more until you became so repressed and irritated, then that's something that you can really own and look at for, from your relationship. The next source of divorce is where you're not letting your partner win at loving you. Now, this is, this is when you, you're, to be honest, you're just hard work. <laughs> so if you can look at your, your relationship and go, yeah, actually, I was really hard work. You know, nothing was ever good enough. I was hard to please. I didn't make it easy for my partner. I sulked a lot. I argued a lot. I was irritated you know, I was angry, I was snappy, you know, I just made it really, really difficult. And everything that they tried to make me happy, I would bulk at it. I'd be like, oh, you call that a present? What is that? You know, oh, you're wearing that again, you look terrible. All those snippy kind of remarks, um, or any kind of, you know, dissatisfaction at gifts that they give you, or, or things that they try and do, or they washed the dishes and they didn't do the dishes well enough for you. All that is actually you just being really hard work to live with and you're not letting your partner win or having an experience of, of it being easy to love you. If it feels hard for them, guess what? They'll start withdrawing from the relationship and finding happiness and satisfaction outside of the relationship. So this is particularly pertinent if your partner has cheated on you. You need to take responsibility and take a look at what have you contributed to that happening. Partners who cheat are not, they're not the only people that are kind of responsible for that. You know, if, if anyone is cheating in a relationship, both partners need to take a look at how they've contributed to that happening. Comparing your partner to a checklist. Okay, so this is when you have very, very high expectations and you're holding your partner up against this list of expectations and they're never good enough. They can never do anything good enough. They're never enough, you know, and you're just constantly disappointed, constantly irritated, constantly annoyed, 
again, that goes hand in hand with not letting your partner win at loving you, but slightly different. This is not just hard work. This is impossible. Okay. This is the realm of, you know, nothing I do is good enough for you. Okay. If you're constantly comparing your partner to a checklist, then you're also assuming that you're perfect and your partner isn't. This is very arrogant. So if you kind of have left your relationship with lots of complaints about your ex, about, you know, they were terrible at this, this, and this, and then, you might have a theory that actually you had the wrong partner and you just need to get the right one. I'm sorry. That is not a helpful conclusion to make. If you are holding one person up against the checklist, how you do anything is how you do everything. And that actually means that you have very high expectations in life and are a difficult person to be in a relationship with. You should address that. Next thing is if you're living in a dream world of unrealistic perfection. So these are the couples, um, really great television show. I think it's called Big Little, Big Little Lies. And it's, it's all about this kind of community of, you know, Stepford wives and everything is perfect and happy husbands. And, you know, so from the outside world, everything looks really beautiful and perfect. And, you know, and on the inside, all hell was breaking loose. You know, they're just terrible relationships, terrible dynamics, all sorts of issues happening. So you got to take a look. Were you guys like the star couple, everything perfect? You know, you think of Brad and Angelina. You know, everything was perfect, amazing. Wow, they're the star couple, the perfect couple. And, you know, in reality, all kinds of things were happening in the background. So what they were projecting to the outside world did not reflect the reality of what was going on. When you're living in that dream world or that facade, there's a lot of pressure to keep up that dream space. So you feel very lonely. You can't really admit to people that things are not going well. Um, and that's when you go through a divorce, there's massive shock in your community. What? You guys are getting divorced? You've got to be kidding me. And then you feel really alone and isolated because now you've, you, you've, you've failed at something where people were holding you up against this big picture. So if you were living in that dream world or the, the projected world, your divorce is going to be very hard for you because you, you know, the world has now come crashing down. And you want to take a look at how you can kind of as I put it, keep it real, keep it real, not perfect. Sometimes you argue with your partner, you know, try to focus on moving forward, not being so perfect and projecting an unrealistic expectation. You want to just keep it real in your relationships, keep it real in your life, tell the truth, be honest, be fully self-expressed. Next one, uh, the last one we're going to cover is being stuck in what we call a drama triangle with your partner. So the drama triangle is when you're in a perpetual cycle of your partner's a victim, you're the rescuer, or somebody's the bully in the relationship. Because those are the kind of three roles that, that take place in a drama triangle. So the bully is the one that is always controlling, dominating proceedings. The rescuer has got to rush in and save the day and care for everybody and support everybody and sort everything out. Martyr, you know, so if you find that in your marriage, you were often like, oh, don't worry, I'll do it. Then you are prone to being in that kind of rescuer martyr space. Or if you're in the, you know, you can admit to yourself that you were in a space that you were always the victim, you needed help, you needed rescuing, or your partner was always needing rescuing. You know, these kinds of relationships are totally exhausting. Um, so if you're in that space where you're like, I'm the bully, she's the victim, I'm the rescuer, we're running around and we're just exhausted and everybody's like, there's, there's just so much drama in your relationship. And not recognizing that you were stuck in a drama triangle can often lead to divorce. So take a look at these sources, see if you can locate yourself in any of them. And if you can relate to any of them, if you can relate to all of them, great. That's good, good move forward. But the whole thing with looking at what you can be responsible for, the minute you can be responsible for something, you are taking action in a positive direction and you're taking charge of something. When you're in a place where, oh, well, I have no idea what happened. It has nothing to do with me you know, she left me and I'm all by myself now, then you're in a space of being a victim and that's not very empowering. 
So take a look at these sources and take a look further and deeper. What else can I be responsible for? But how can I be responsible without resorting to self-loathing and hatred? Because that's not very positive either. So let's take a look at the things you can do to really thrive after a divorce. Okay, so that's kind of the last part of the webinar is looking at thriving. Okay. When you're looking at wanting to thrive after a divorce, you, you need good support to make that happen. Now, family, bless them. They're not always the best support through a divorce, okay? If you find out, you know, that your family hasn't been particularly supportive, well, welcome to the club. That is what being divorced is all about. So people around you, your family or friends, they may say inappropriate things. They may say things like, Oh yeah, yeah. I'm sorry it didn't work out. Um, yeah, I never really liked your ex anyway. <laughs> or they may say things like, um, "Oh, don't worry. There's lots of fish in the sea." Or you know, God never gives you a, a crisis that He doesn't think you can cope with. You know, just odd things, strange things that you know they just don't make you feel any better. They're kind of strange and they they make you feel worse. Sometimes, you know, your support network are tired of hearing about your drama and they're like, well, why don't I set you up with um, Fred? Fred's going to be fantastic. And you're like, but we've only been divorced for 26 minutes. How can you be setting me up with Fred already? Like, I don't want to meet Fred. And then, and then because they don't, you know, you don't like their suggestion, then they get really upset with you and they change the subject. Okay, so sometimes they're trying to be helpful, but exactly what they're doing is precisely what you don't want or need at that time. Some really want to revel in the drama, and these ones you need to be careful of. They're the ones that lean in and go, oh, oh tell me the story. Oh, my God, that sounds unbelievable. Oh, and then what happened? Oh, and all that kind of drama is not helpful either. So it might feel nice, you know, when they're leaning in and asking all these questions, but it's not helpful. It actually makes things more dramatic for you. It doesn't help you to move on. And it, it's kind of keeps you in this place of being a victim as they try and rescue the situation. People that revel in the drama, drama also gossips. So they're probably running around telling lots of people your business and that's not helpful either. Some people in your support network just don't want to talk about it. They just want to change the topic deal with something else. They're getting exasperated with you. They're irritated with you. And you can't, you, in those places, you can feel really isolated. For me, this is one of the big things. It's like no one, it's like, it's like I became radioactive. The minute I became divorced, it's like, oh, oh, we don't want to be around that. I don't want to catch your disease. Like, and I found myself, I was in at dinner with, with a friend and I was sort of talking to her about what had happened in my divorce. And, and she was like, well, you know, my husband and I are really happy. And I just thought, well, that's just such an odd thing to say. Like your husband is, and you are really happy. I'm trying to talk about my divorce and you want to like talk about you're really happy. And, and she's like, well, I'm glad that wouldn't happen to me and my husband because we're really happy. So it's almost like I have a disease. I'm on the outside. And, and my friends do not have this disease and they don't want to kind of get infected with whatever it is I have. So again, if you find yourself in this place where people are being a bit weird, don't worry. It's quite normal. Okay. You also, as Sally was kind of really stating, you need to watch out for leaning on your children. Okay. And hiding behind their needs or their wants, because that's, that's going to harm them in the long run. Um, and it's going to, it's going to be really traumatic for you one day when they leave home because then you, you, you know, you haven't figured it out and you've delayed your healing to the moment when they've actually left home. Do not make them your crutch. Okay. It's hard. It's a lot of pressure for them. I think Simon was sharing at the beginning with his parents going through a divorce. He became his mum's crutch at a very, very young age. And he felt that pressure all the time that he needed to kind of make his mum happy. It's very sad when that happens for kids. So be careful to lean on your children too much when you're going through a divorce. It's not going to be help helpful in their, in their lives. Actually, just to uh, interrupt there and say an additional bit. I think um, when you're in a situation like this, actually your children are going to see how you deal with challenging times. And this 
you know, they are going to mirror that in their lives when they have changing times themselves. And we've seen that many, many times. So whilst it can be very difficult, you know, this is actually a time when you can kind of inspire them and they see that you have been able to deal with this situation. You've taken advice, you've gone somewhere and they've seen you cope with it. You know, they are going to take that similar sort of philosophy themselves, even if it's like five, ten years in the future when they have challenges themselves with relationships, etc. So I actually think this is a, a really important kind of teaching time um, when you have children. Absolutely. I mean, in, in, it's going to sound really basic, but, you know, and kind of boiled down to some principles. But, you know, your job as a parent is to produce viable adults. I know that sounds very transactional, but as much as you love them and you, you know, you want to give them all the, the opportunities in life to produce a viable adult, you always need to consider what am I training my children in right now? So Simon makes a really good point that you, the way that you handle this trauma can either really, really harm your children or can inspire them for the future. I mean, one of my clients that I'm working with right now, you know, she's, she's a child of divorce and the divorce was so traumatic and her mother lent on her so heavily that she has, she's an, she's an adult. She's, she has adult issues from that trauma that she went through, which we're processing together right now. I mean, there's, you know, and it's extensive, the impact that that had on her life. So really consider that when you want to thrive through divorce, what is your support network and how are you handling this so that you can move forward? So really the kind of support that you need in your life is an angel. Okay, you need someone that is going to walk alongside you, but not rescue you, not jump in, sort you out, disempower you, treat you like some sort of sad victim, or give you lots of instructions of what you need to do. It's someone who's walking alongside you that is guiding you back into the proverbial light. Okay, so an angel is a very specific function, and this is one of the critical things you need to heal. Okay. You need the right support. You need that angel. The next thing that you really, really need to heal is you need to take action. Time does not heal the wound. It's what you do with the time that matters. You need to be focused and really take structured action. You also need to take specific action. Okay. You need to ask yourself, am I committed to this healing? And am I going to do something that is going to take me forward? Okay. In a structured way. So if so, you need to take that action and, you know, good action that you can take is to get your, is to kind of design yourself or get yourself into a program that has steps, that has results, that actually has outcomes that you're producing. And every day you're moving forward in a positive way. You're not sitting around waiting for something to happen. So one other option that you've got to do, uh, could take, and you could take that today, is the Naked Divorce 21 Day Program. So we've talked a little bit about that. Um, and basically, through hundreds now thousands of people who've gone through the program, we've really worked out there's three critical phases of the recovery process. And the first phase is, we talked about this quite, quite a bit during this webinar today, about getting grounded. So we call that the first phase, the divorce cocoon. That's where we get you grounded emotionally before we move to the second phase, which is where actually all the change, and actually kind of where all the wisdom takes place. We call that the metamorphosis. Uh, and that's where we're understanding the source of our divorce, where we're understanding where perhaps where we were, have some responsibility there. And that can be a really challenging thing to, to even consider. And one thing that's almost universal with people that do struggle to go with divorce is they think the problem's with their partner. And if we actually take some of that responsibility back, it means it's inside our reach and we can actually change that and be responsible for that. And it, you know, that leads to uh, progress. And the third and final sort of phase is what we call the release phase. That's making sure that these sort of new learnings and new ways of being are, are captured at a deep level. So this is not just a short term kind of uh, feeling slightly better. This is actually about real change and we're actually you know, going to go into future relationships in a way that's much more powerful and, uh, and going to serve us very, very well. So we go across those three phases inside a 21-day, very organized, structured package. Now, if you have gone to our website before, you may already have seen this. We have our top package. It's with a Delta on. 
That's called our miracle package. And that's where Adele basically holds your hand and guides you through that 21 day package. And uh, that package, as you can see, there's $1,997. Now, there's not anything we can do with the prices there. We actually have a waiting list for people that want to work with Adele. But what we've done today, let's come up with a slightly different variation of this package, which may you might find uh, more appropriate or more, might be more appealing for you. So we've got a uh, start. This all starts off with a one-to-one -one private session with Sally Golding. It's a 60-minute call. So we'll go through your, your healing goals and we'll look at that, look at the actions you need to take to achieve those goals. And then we'll take you into the 21 day online program. It's got email support throughout that process and you can access all your material via the web. You can do that on your mobile as well. So you, you can do this any time of the day and you can do it any, anywhere that's comfortable for you uh, and build it into your routines. Every day you're going to see video and audio guides. You're going to have exercises and things that you need to perform. So this is not just about reading. They're actually physical exercises sometimes you need to do. You need to sometimes write messages, make notes, etc. Um, and the support is lasts for 21 days. Now, if that's of interest to you, um, this is the, the URL you can go to. So it's just www.tinyurl.com forward slash 21 dash day dash men. That is case sensitive, so write that down. And of course, the women's version is exactly the same with the women at the end there. Now, because it's a slightly different package, of course, we can offer a slightly different price. So it's no longer 1997 instead, and this offer is only for today now. Uh, today, it's just $499. So we've got lots of uh, testimonials, and you'll see these um, on the website. I'll just go through these. Just got three examples here. So it's Kerry, very powerful, absolutely great. I wanted to be a completely new woman and with a new outlook on marriage. I really encourage people to do this program. It's easy. It doesn't take anything, and it supports you every moment of the day. And there's many, many other. There's lots of video testimonials as well there, which you can see on the web pages. So in addition to that, the very first three people that sign up today will actually get Adele for that first session. Okay, and we'll do this at a very special price at just $299. So that is a, a price we've never done this sort of package before at that rate. So if you are really committed to making a change and making progress, you know, there will never be a better price and there will never be a better time to do this. So, I'd urge you to go there and certainly consider doing this. Right, so now it's prize time. So we have a question for you. And the question is, oh, hang on. And that's the prize. is a one-hour coaching call with Sally. You can discuss any topic and any time that is suitable for you. And the question is, what does STE stand for? So, Type it into your question panel as quick as you can. I'm just going to go and mute for a second and look at that. Okay, so we have Tony Watling has uh, got the answer right. So well done, Tony. So we'll be sending you, if you can just type in your email address into the chat feature for us, then we'll send out an email to you and we'll go arrange that uh, prize for you so you can have that call with Sally. So thank you very much. Um, now we move forward to our last bit, which is our Q&A section. So if you had any questions that come up, you haven't typed them in already, then type those in now. So we've got a couple that have come through already, and I'm going to do those now. So perhaps I'll put Adele and Sally back into the microphone here. So first question is, what do I do with a violent partner? Oh, yeah. Okay, so thank you um, to Miss T for asking that question. That's, I mean, obviously, having a violent partner is very challenging. Um, I think one of the critical things you, you kind of need to work out 
if you're going through a divorce of a violent partner, you've been a victim of domestic abuse, how many people actually know about that? So the safest thing you can do to protect yourself is you need to start talking about what is happening, talking about the abuse and, and actually having some witnesses to what has occurred. So you need to document what has happened, photographic evidence, you know, documented evidence, and you need to start communicating and telling people about it so that you're not on your own dealing with something like that. You actually have a bit of a support network. The next thing when you're dealing with um, a violent partner is, you, is it really doesn't help to do things that are going to aggravate the situation and make things more volatile. So if that person shouts and screams and you shout and scream back, if that is going to impact your safety, that's not really going to help you. So you need to get um, assistance, particularly if someone has been violent and they've hurt you. You need to, um, if, if possible, have a crime reference number. You need to report this to the police. Um, you need to have that document trail of what has occurred. If you're dealing with someone that is kind of problematic, has narcissistic behavior or, or borderline personality disorder, in those instances, you need to have a very careful strategy of how you cope with somebody like that. So we actually have a separate program where we help you negotiate with um, really tricky, complex people and work out the exact strategy and, and process that you need to use to negotiate with a narcissist versus negotiate with someone with borderline personality disorder. So we can take you through that. But the main, I mean, the critical thing when you have a violent partner is you need you need that document trail. You need the witnesses because, you know, once, you know, you are going through a divorce and there's maybe you're going to court. If you don't have that in place, you don't have what you require to move things forward, to secure things for your future. So start getting that document trail um, and your witnesses as soon as possible. Yeah, absolutely. I'll just say, I mean, if, um, if, he has, if there's bruises, there's cuts, if there's physical injuries they you know photograph them um you may never need these photos may never ever refer to them but but take the documentation so yeah okay here's another question how do i sort of go about making arrangements for viewing the children when he doesn't respond to any of my messages so clearly someone's trying to sort of co-parent but they're not engaging and they're, they're struggling to deal with that situation that's very sad i mean one of the things that we see you know um you know, we'd love to think that everyone that goes through a divorce, when they're co-parenting together, they are all focused on, you know, doing what's best for the children. And sadly, in more than a half of divorces, that is not the case. Like, people do not think about their children in a positive way. They, you know, using the children as their ammunition or... They feel so guilty and awful about this divorce thing. They just want to put it behind them and just start their new life. And in those instances, um, we often see partners just want to um, delete their past and not engage with their children. In those instances, when you're trying to engage with somebody that doesn't want to engage, that's very, very painful for your kids. They're going to feel rejected. They're going to have, quote unquote, abandonment issues. So number one, you need to um, immediately focus on replacing that role model in their life. So if it's a, a father figure that is absent and disappearing, your child still needs a father figure in their life in some way, shape or form. So are there other people that you can introduce to them, have them spend more time, uh, you know, hanging with, you know, can they join scouts or girl guides or, or something where they can have strong uh, father or maternal um, energy around them that is a positive role model? Is there an aunt? Is there a, a family friend? Okay, so it's that, that is the critical thing is to replace that role model. The next thing is you yourself need to explain to children that... Um, you know, that the, your love is never going to go away and that the reason that that person is not around is because they're hurting. You need to, you know, try and explain that it's not about the child being left, that it's because that parent is hurting and maybe it's easy for them to not be around. So I would definitely make that kind of explanation rather than avoid the, the situation completely. The, the final thing you need to do is, is definitely... Um, 
get your children some support. So get a, a therapist or psychology, a psychological session in place so that your, your child can actually explore how they feel in a therapy session. Uh, just a question coming in about actually purchasing the package. Yes, if you go to that web page, you'll see there's actually three different options. There's the option with Adele, there's option with another angel, and the cheapest package there is a renewal package. That's the one to click on. Um, we haven't done a whole new web page for this, but if you click on renewal and make the payment there, just $299, it will include the package we talked about with the, the startup call for 60 minutes. Okay, so the next message here, um, and uh, thank you for typing this one in, uh, Vashni. Uh, I ended the relationship, but a year later, I'm struggling with him having met someone. She's lovely and her children adore her. I am struggling with him being with someone else. How do I cope uh, with that and how do I move on? Well, the main reason you're struggling with this is because you haven't moved on. Okay, so it's, you know, if you haven't actually consciously been focusing on processing your divorce and, and taking the, the positive steps to move on from what has happened, you will be stuck. You, you will kind of be in this limbo where you're unhappy with him having met somebody. Now, if you had processed this, you, you probably wouldn't be in a position where you're as upset with him moving on. So my top recommendation would be that you need to focus on processing what has happened. You know, you need to Take some of the steps that we've spoken about in this webinar. You need to get grounded. You need to have the healing goal in place. You need to look at your nutrition. You need to have a positive action plan. You need to start looking at what you can be responsible for. And doing a program like the Naked Divorce is really positive in that moment. It's like, what steps are you actually taking to move on? Because if you fast forward the probable future in a year or two's time, if you don't do anything, you're still going to have a problem. And you, you're not going to have moved forward and met somebody yourself. So I think taking action and, and processing this is the top recommendation I can give you. Okay, great. Um, okay, I'm just aware of time. So we're probably going to do this as the last question. Any other questions that come in, we will reply via email. But this will probably be the last question we can deal with on this uh, event. Um, and so perhaps I'll ask both of you to have a Ask to this one. So, um, my doctor's actually prescribed me to antidepressants. Is that something you think's a good idea? That's probably a difficult question. Not always mm. easy. Yeah, I mean, I think I, you know, if you, um, it's a really difficult one because you know. Okay, so let me just start by saying antidepressants are a very important uh, tool to help control, uh, you know really, really strong feelings of depression and anxiety. Um, they should uh, be taken seriously. And if somebody has prescribed them and you feel you need them, you need to really look at that. I am personally not a massive fan of antidepressants. Um, when people go through a really, really bad trauma, the number one thing they need to do is they need to process the uh, emotional and cognitive impact of that trauma as quickly as possible. Um, if they wait too long, that can lead to depression. It can lead to uh, anxiety or general anxiety disorder, which then means you need antidepressants to kind of cope with that. So if you are on antidepressants right now, um, you can still do a program like the Naked Divorce. Um, we would work very carefully with you. We would make sure that, um, you know, we'd look at your dosage. We'd work with your, your clinician that has prescribed the antidepressants so that we are, are clear that you are grounded and you're in your cocoon and you're safe. Um, you definitely do not want to go cold turkey of antidepressants. They need to be stepped down in consultation with a clinician. So I think, I think it can be a good idea if you're incredibly depressive and almost suicidal. I think it's a lifesaver. But if you're feeling mildly upset and this has been your solution, then you should work with your clinician at slowly, um, carefully, and in a controlled way, coming off the antidepressants, but definitely in consultation with them. I would not just go cold turkey. I think that's a really bad idea. So I think what we're saying here, then this is a temporary Band-Aid at best and should be used as a temporary solution and with the goal to be moving past it and getting off of them as soon as it seems viable. 
that- yeah and safely but i think it doesn't it doesn't prevent you from doing a program like the naked divorce i mean we we often have people um that do the program you know people that come on the haven retreat often people that are on the haven retreat are very very depressed they're quite you know um suicidal so i work with a lot of people that are on antidepressants and you know we can work with them provided we know exactly what you want what your dosage is we're working with your medical advisor then we understand that i mean if it takes the edge off and it makes you feel a bit better it's great i just think you know, a lot of times when people are prescribing antidepressants, they're prescribing them to control their own risk. So sometimes people just prescribe antidepressants left, right, and center, and it's not necessarily the solution to every single problem. You know, if you've been on antidepressants for longer than a year, you need to look at, at actually processing this so that you could move forward. So actually just a couple of points, which I do need to uh, deal with here. So, Kevin, you said you had some uh, issue actually purchasing the package. Perhaps you could type in your email address for me and I can actually send you an email uh, directly back and make sure we get that uh, fixed for you. So obviously we'll want to get you part, part of the package. Um, so Kevin, just send me through your direct email address and I'll solve that for you. And uh, back to um, Vashni has a question about the, the retreats here, particularly in Cape Town. So yes. that's actually held by, by Sally. Yes, yes. Um, well, please do get in touch. We'll be very happy to send you more information. Um, and um, I'm available also to have a chat with you. And I could just take you through what we do at the retreat and what it involves. Um, and we'll be very happy to work with you, Vashni, there in Cape Town. So what I'll do there, Vashni, is, uh, again, if you could actually type in your email address, I'll send you an email, they'll find a suitable time for you, and I'll arrange that call. Just to be really clear, that's a, an unpaid call. It's a short call you can have with Sally, just to go through and explain in a bit more detail exactly what is included in the, the Haven Retreat, make sure that's suitable for you, and learn a little bit more about where you are as well. And then you can decide um, if that's something you want to go ahead with. So just send us your uh, direct email address and following this call, I'll send you that message and we'll get that um, all set up. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. just a word on the retreats. They're so, they're just so beautiful. They're apps. They're, they're like our favorite thing to run. Well, we've got phenomenal results from them. Haven't we? Well, it's not just that. I mean, it's, it's seven days, right? So it's absolutely phenomenal what can be achieved when we work very, very intensively with somebody and, you know, we've incorporated like ceremonies that unwind your marriage. We have like beautiful locations that we're doing the work in. You know, there's some beautiful processes incorporated in that and they're empowering and people kind of leave uh, just so, that, so happy. I think it's great. And I think people get a lot of benefit about being in a different environment to actually go through a stage of change. And they're, they're away from their normal rigmarole, their normal situation. And they actually have a little bit of a clearer mental space to actually consider some of the teachings. That seems to me mm. to be what's going on with, with all the retreats yes. we've done. And I think the focus aspect is so important from what I've seen is that on a retreat, people are in, in an environment where they focus on themselves, on the journey that they're going through. And I think without, without the distraction of daily life, that really makes a massive difference. And it's really a phenomenal results we achieve in just a very short period of time. Okay, guys, that's all from us. I hope you found that of benefit. We have lovely messages coming through. A lot of people found that really valuable. Um, uh, again, for all the questions we didn't get to, I will or we will actually address those by email. It may take us a little bit of time to get to all of those, but just bear with us. Uh, and for those specific uh, questions about logging in and making purchase, I'll send you an email just a few minutes after this call and hopefully we can get that sorted for you. Thank you. Do you want to say goodbye, guys? Yeah, thank you so much for attending this webinar. You know, the, the, what's great is you took some positive action. You're going through something tough. You took some positive action, so congratulate yourself for that. And, you know, if you need, uh, you know, something, take action. You know, we've invited you. We've given you some really special offers on this call. Take that action. We don't offer these kinds of uh, offers all the time because we can't. We just, we are fully booked all the time. But, you know, take that action and move forward in a positive way. Yes. Um, thank you, uh, 
to, for being with us today. And we really do look forward to hearing from you and working with you in the future. Thank you. All the best. Bye for now.